Thanks for the memory of sentimental verse. Nothing in my purse. WOAI, your clear channel station, San Antonio. Well, that's the way it used to be back in 1938 when this master control console here was installed down in San Antonio. But now it's at the National Museum of Communication here in Dallas. Hi, I'm Clyde Knutson. 1938, over 50 years ago, that year changed the course of world history forever. In January, President Franklin Roosevelt asked Congress for $800 million to build America's largest peacetime navy. In February, Adolf Hitler appointed himself Supreme Commander of the German military machine and in March took Austria in two days. The Spanish Civil War came to an end in April and in May, Congress raised the minimum wage to a hefty 40 cents an hour. And in June, Joe Lewis knocked out Max Schmeling in the first round. And on July 13th, Howard Hughes set the new around the world speed record at 208 miles an hour in his new Lockheed Electra. And just a month later, in August, out in Utah, a new automobile speed record was set at 345 miles an hour. And Hitler called a million men to active duty. And in September, Britain and France started arming and preparing for what was to become World War II. And in October, Orson Welles gave America a Halloween present called War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. And it wasn't until quite a few hours later that the majority of listeners realized that it actually wasn't an invasion from outer space. It was just a radio broadcast. Two weeks later in November, Kate Smith introduced Irving Berlin's immortal anthem, God Bless America. December was a good year for Hollywood actors such as Gary Cooper, Humphrey Bogart, Spencer Tracy, and others. But it was a bad year for much of the world. World War II had started. We came to this museum doing research for our Driving Through Texas series, and here we found a fantastic collection of old communication equipment. Telegraph keys from the covered wagon days, early radios and telephones, a television set used in 1938, and much, much more. Meanwhile, we uncovered an old forgotten film, a virtual time capsule of Texas history called A Cavalcade of Texas. It, too, was produced in 1938. Gone with the Wind and The Wizard of Oz were still a year away. Back in 1938, there were no television stations in Texas. So a film crew spent almost a year producing one of Texas' earliest travelogues. Back then, in order to produce a color film, a very large Technicolor camera was used. In fact, it was so heavy, it had to be hauled around on a big truck. Well, let's turn back the clock over 50 years, back to 1938. Ideally situated on the continent of North America, like a giant atlas supporting the continent itself, stands the great and powerful state of Texas, representing one-twelfth the land area of the United States, and benevolently endowed by nature with an overabundance of the good things of life. Under the respective flags of France, Spain, and Mexico, the history of Texas was first recorded, but it was under the flag of Texas itself that a republic was born and destined to become one of the greatest, if not the greatest states, in the United States of America. 
In reviewing the history of Texas, it is fitting that we should begin with the city of San Antonio, for it was here that the first permanent white settlement was inaugurated by the Spaniards. And it was here that old Moses Austin first applied for land grants to settle Americans within the boundaries of Spanish Texas. In 1821, when Mexico seceded from Spain, Texas automatically became a province of Mexico, where differences arose which ultimately developed a war between them. And among the historic landmarks which are associated with this struggle for independence is the world-famous Alamo. Within the walls of this sacred shrine, a little over a century ago, a thrilling battle was fought in which 185 Texans to a man were massacred by the orders of Santa Ana, the Mexican dictator, who was hated as much by the people of Mexico as he was by the people of Texas. Here in this garden of memories, nurtured by the blood of the defenders of the Alamo, was born the spirit of independence that is still the cherished heritage of every true-born Texan. Not far from the Alamo is another landmark, the patio of the governor's palace, where Spanish governors once strolled and meditated in the days when Texas belonged to Spain. In the courtyard may be seen original pavement remotely illustrating the artistic endeavors of the builders who could not refrain from duplicating the decorative patterns of their mother country. In the suburbs of San Antonio, we behold the picturesque ruins of old Spanish missions, the first landmarks of civilization in a land that was originally populated by barbaric Indians known as Tejos, from whom, incidentally, the word Texas was derived. Built as a protection from the Indians, as well as the elements, each mission naturally formed a pivotal center of the community which grew up under its tutelage and protection. Thousands of visitors from all parts of the world visit San Antonio every year, and one of the highlights of their visit is a tour of these famous old missions, each one of which has some particular attraction which merits the attention and admiration of all travelers. The famous facade and doors of the San Jose Mission, for example, built over a century and a half ago, when Texas was still a remote wilderness, holding within its vast areas secret treasures unknown to men. In interesting contrast to the Spanish era, there is a little house at Washington on the Brazos, where a group of patriotically inspired Texans assembled in the year of 1836 and declared Texas to be a free and independent republic. This monument commemorates the memory of George Childress, who is credited with the authorship of the Declaration of Independence for the Republic of Texas. On the battlefield of San Jacinto, where the decisive battle between the armies of Texas and Mexico was fought, stands the San Jacinto Monument, one of the finest memorials in the state of Texas. The shaft towers above the Washington Monument, and it is the largest of its kind in the world. There are 850 steps from the basement of the shaft to the observation tower. The monument weighs over 70 million pounds, and the cost of its erection exceeded a million dollars. The design of the monument is credited to Jesse H. Jones, chairman of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, a true gentleman of the South who has always taken great pride in the development of his state as well as his country. To General Sam Houston, who commanded the Army of Texas at San Jacinto, is given the credit of winning one of the 16 decisive battles of the world. Near the close of his illustrious career, he lived in this house at Huntsville which is erected on the campus grounds of the Sam Houston State Teachers College. It was largely through the unfailing efforts of the students and faculty of the college that this home has been perpetuated as one of the most cherished shrines of the Lone Star State. Picturesquely situated on a hill overlooking the Houston homestead is the colorful administration building of the Sam Houston State Teachers College. And just below it stands the Sam Houston Memorial Museum in which may be seen many relics of early Texas history. On the wall of this colorful shrine, one may read a patriotic thought that emanated from the mind of Sam Houston. 
In the promotion of my country, every energy of my mind shall be employed with a fervent invocation to the God who buildeth up nations, that his wisdom may direct us in honor, and that the people of this nation may be established in virtue, in prosperity, and in happiness. President Houston's message to the Congress of the Republic of Texas, December 20th, 1841. In Huntsville Cemetery, we find the final resting place of General Sam Houston. Soldier under Jackson, boy hero of Horseshoe Bend, congressman from Tennessee, governor of Tennessee, chief of the Cherokees, commander in chief of Texan Army, hero of San Jacinto, twice president of the Republic of Texas, United States Senator from Texas, Governor of Texas. General Sam Houston, born near Lexington, Virginia, March 2nd, 1793, died in Huntsville, Texas, July 26th, 1863. A brave soldier, a fearless statesman, a great orator, a pure patriot, a faithful friend, a loyal citizen, a devoted husband and father, a consistent Christian, an honest man. A few hundred miles from here at the little town of Laporte on the Gulf of Mexico, there lives a gentleman named Colonel Andrew Jackson Houston, the 84-year-old son of General Sam Houston. At dawn and at twilight, Colonel Houston religiously attends the ritual of raising and lowering the respective flags of his state and his country. For like his famous father, he is endowed with an innate sense of patriotism. Although the Republic of Texas was annexed to the United States in the year of 1846, the Lone Star flag still holds a sacred place in the hearts of all Texans, not the least of whom is Colonel Andrew Jackson Houston. Perhaps the greatest memorial to the memory of Colonel Houston's illustrious father is the city that was named after him, Houston, the largest metropolis in the state of Texas, claiming a population of over 450,000 inhabitants and said to be the fastest growing city in the Western Hemisphere. Houston is the hub of the Texas and Louisiana oil fields, a list numbering close to 250 separate and distinct fields. Due chiefly to oil, therefore, Houston has enjoyed greater prosperity than any other American city during the past 25 years. Incidentally, the Capitol building of the Texas Republic was erected in Houston in 1837, and on the site where it once stood, there now stands an imposing edifice known as the Rice Hotel, containing a thousand rooms, modern in every detail. In fact, most of the hotels of Texas are on a par with the best in the world. Houston is particularly proud of its beautiful homes, ranging anywhere from a pretentious mansion in town to a modest cottage in the suburbs, such as we see here. Noticeable features of Bob Holmes in the residential districts of Houston is the absence of crowding, and this is generally characteristic throughout the entire state, a state that is blessed with unlimited acres for the building of homes. And this may account somewhat for the unusual open-mindedness and hospitality of the Texans, who invite all industrious Americans to build their homes and cast their destinies with them in the prosperous and progressive state of Texas. One of the most important developments in the history of Texas is the Houston Ship Channel, which runs from Galveston on the Gulf of Mexico to the city of Houston, a distance of 50 miles. Ships from all parts of the world sail in and out of Houston Channel with precious cargoes of freight, representing a large percent of the export and import trade of the United States. And in addition to this, regular passenger service is maintained between Houston and practically all ports of call throughout the world. Houston ships daily a half a million barrels of refined and crude oil products, representing four-fifths of the total export tonnage of the port. Among the numerous other commodities shipped from here are cotton, wheat, and lumber, the main staples of Texas. One of the
of the less important but unique industries of this port is the oyster shell industry. These shells are used for cement construction as well as for poultry food. Portland cement is another commodity that commands a conspicuous place in the Houston port. And here we find evidence of one shipment that did not materialize. These empty tanks were sent from Germany to Texas to be filled with helium gas. But for reasons best known to the federal government, the order was held up and all of these tanks have since been returned empty to Herr Hitler. And now we come to what is unquestionably the greatest development ever inaugurated in the state of Texas, the so-called Trinity River Project, which involves the dredging of a navigable channel in the Trinity River from Galveston Bay on the Gulf of Mexico through the most thickly populated areas of the state to the great cities of Dallas and Fort Worth, a distance of almost 400 miles. The vast territory to be served by the canalization of the Trinity is larger than the combined areas of Ohio, West Virginia, Kentucky, Indiana, Illinois, and Missouri. And no section in the United States offers greater opportunities for the creation of new wealth. Agricultural products alone include over 8 million tons of grain, and more than one half the nation's known deposits of petroleum are found within the tributary area, along with unlimited quantities of lignite, coal, potash, limestone, sulfur, and a reserve of more than 200 million tons of iron ore. Most of these natural resources are now lying dormant or only partially developed because of excessively high freight rates. Since 1914, rail rates within this area have increased 72%. By improving the Trinity River for navigation, over $15 million annually will be saved by the shippers and receivers who use this waterway. But let us diverge from the Trinity Project for a moment and observe one of its chief ports of call, the city of Dallas, second largest in Texas, with a population of approximately 300,000 inhabitants, an increase of over 750% since the census of 1900. In maintaining its phenomenal growth, Dallas has wisely distributed its source of income so that its commercial destiny does not depend on any one product. It is particularly noted for its tremendous volume of retail trade, conservatively estimated at $161 million annually, the largest total of any southwestern city. Perhaps the greatest event in the history of Dallas was in 1936, when the Texas Centennial was celebrated with an elaborate fair, which attracted millions of visitors from all parts of the world. Many of the buildings are still standing in convincing testimonial of the elaborateness of the fair and prodigious manner in which things are done in the city of Dallas. The state of Texas building, referred to as the Westminster Abbey of the New World, now used as the Dallas Historical Museum, and the United States building, which housed the federal exhibit, were two of the outstanding architectural achievements of the centennial. Architectural contrast, in fact, was one of the many interesting features of this fair, where the idealized log cabin of the Texas Rangers vied with the more fanciful architecture of a Swiss village. Nightlife in the main streets of Dallas is enhanced by a colorful array of illuminations which compare favorably with those in the best lighted cities of the world. This thriving city of Dallas is only one of the numerous cities and towns that will be served by the Grand Canal of the Trinity River Basin. New communities will be developed and the benefits of this colossal enterprise will also be extended to sections of Louisiana, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico. In addition to this, a million acres of floodlands along the main stem of the Trinity and its principal tributaries will be reclaimed. In the lakes north of Fort Worth, there is a tremendous reserve supply of water, sufficient to guarantee equalization of water in the Trinity Canal at all seasons of the year. And here we divert our attention again to another great metropolis to be served by the Trinity Canal, 
the city of Fort Worth, with a population of approximately 180,000 inhabitants. Chiefly because of its favorable location, almost midway between the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, nine trunk line railroads with 16 rail outlets serve the city of Fort Worth, and its impressive and modern railway station is a fair indication of how well the city has accepted the responsibility of serving the railroads. The United States Post Office also reminds us that Fort Worth is one of the principal mail centers of North America. Vying with the modern buildings of the city is the old town hall, around which converges the political destiny of Fort Worth. These huge grain elevators remind us that Fort Worth is the largest terminal grain market in the South. And while we are on the subject of superlatives, we must include the Live Stock Exchange, where business is transacted for one of the largest livestock markets in the world. In the early hours of the morning, the stockyards on the outskirts of the city literally teem with activity, and practically every corral is filled with cattle. But when the noon sun sends its photographic rays into the yards, only a few horned heads may be seen in an occasional corral. A giant causeway leading to Galveston Island is a fair illustration of how Texas meets its construction problems, an engineering feat formerly regarded as a wild dream, but now a reality, attracting the attention of engineers from all parts of the world. Owing to its ideal location on the Gulf of Mexico, Galveston is a natural port of call for ships that sail the seven seas ships that will one day transfer their cargoes to canal barges. Sailing from Galveston along the Trinity River as far north as Dallas and Fort Worth, and these same barges will return with precious cargoes from the Trinity River Valley and its tributary areas for shipment by boat to the world's ports of call. A tremendous project to be sure, but nothing worthwhile is too tremendous for the colossal state of Texas. The city of Kilgore, located in the center of the East Texas oil field, is the mecca of the largest oil pool in the world, an ocean of black gold with 26,000 producing wells, 700 of which are in the Kilgore Township, making the city look like a veritable forest of oil wells. Before the discovery of oil, Kilgore was a tiny village with a few families who depended upon their farms for a livelihood. But after the discovery of oil, it suddenly became a boom town. And today, it is one of the wealthiest and most progressive little cities in Texas, with a population of about 20,000 inhabitants, many of whom are owners of oil wells. Churchyards, backyards, front yards, and even graveyards, all have given way to oil wells. A story is told about a church that made so much money with its oil wells that when the collection plate was passed, the congregation was expected to take money out of it rather than to put it in. Needless to say, that particular church has a limited congregation. Even the railway tracks are lined with oil wells, for the IGN Railroad has many wells along its right of way, in addition to hauling over 1,500 tank cars full of oil out of the East Texas every month. This well has reached a depth of about 3,300 feet, and the driller is proceeding with caution, for oil is about 300 feet away. It requires approximately 10 days to drill the average oil well in East Texas, and the cost is about $15,000. In order to facilitate the progress of the drilling, water is pumped into the well through the drill stem, and it flushes back again, bringing with it quantities of shale. Down, down into the depths of the earth, pipe after pipe, sometimes a distance of a mile or more, all for the liquid gold that has brought unprecedented prosperity to Kilgore, as well as to the Lone Star State. 
Most of the East Texas oil wells are gravity wells, which flow without pumping due to powerful gas pressure, forcing the oil up from the earth. The gas which comes up with the oil is extracted and burned as we see it here, so that the waste gas does not become a hazard. At Port Arthur, we observe one of the many great oil refining plants for which Texas is world famous. And we can gather from the size of this plant some idea of the tremendous proportion of the Texas oil industry, a gigantic industry that has already given the world over three billion barrels of oil and promises to remain the nation's greatest petroleum reserve for 20 or more years to come. The city of Amarillo in the northwestern part of Texas is the commercial center of what is known as the Panhandle section, but it probably owes its modern fame to the huge helium gas field which was discovered near the city a few years ago. Helium gas is brought up from the earth through wells like this and piped to a nearby plant where it is placed in containers and shipped to its variegated destinations, all of which is under the strictest of government control. Randolph Field near San Antonio is another great government operation in the state of Texas. The west point of the air where student flyers must devote at least one year to the strictest kind of army discipline before they can win their wings. This flying field is both unique and exclusive. Unique because the cadets receive pay for attending and exclusive because of the high standards of initiation. The physical standard for flying training is higher than that for enlistment in the regular army, and consequently the Randolph Field student body is one of the finest groups of young men to be found in any school in the world. Among the many important industries of Texas is that of sulfur mining, and the plant at New Gulf is an excellent example of how this very interesting process is conducted. Hot water is the lifeblood of the sulfur industry. It is superheated by power plants and sent through these vast pipes to a sulfur pit for the purpose of melting the sulfur before it is forced to the surface by steam. Sulfur wells are like oil wells in appearance, except that a network of pipes is placed in the well, one pipe carrying hot water to melt the sulfur, another carrying compressed air to help force it to the surface, while another pipe conveys it to the huge vats or storage piles where it melts and solidifies in thin layers. A storage pile of sulfur is often as large as a city block. Here we see the boiling liquid sulfur as it comes from the mines and spreads itself over sulfur that has already been cooled and restored to its original state. In its re-solidified condition, the sulfur is broken up for transportation purposes by thrilling blasts of dynamite. Thus, hundreds of tons of pure sulfur are released with each blast. The value of sulfur to mankind is shown by a consideration of the various manufactured articles that either contain sulfur or require it as a reagent, such as explosives, cements, gasoline, alcohol, artificial silk, glass, leather, paper, soap, fertilizers, photography, sugar, and textiles. Approximately a million and a half tons of sulfur about a fourth of the total world's production is produced annually in the state of Texas.
We are now in Lufkin, part of the East Texas commercial timber region. Approximately one-fifth of the broad expanse of Texas is covered with some type of forest growth, which is larger than the forested area in any other state in the nation, and on a comparative basis, equals an area about the size of the whole state of Florida. Of the forested area in Texas, about two-thirds are classed as protection forests, while the remaining third constitutes the commercial forests, which produce primarily the products useful to man. In the early days and until recent years in many localities, the lumbermen depended almost wholly upon natural forces and the logging operations. Steam power, however, altered all these methods, and most of the larger lumber camps now have logging railroads. When the logs reach the mill centers, they are stored in log ponds, which usually cover a number of acres, where they are kept until ready for manufacture. The ponds facilitate a sorting and cleaning, and also prevent deterioration, which would occur if the logs were left dry for any appreciable length of time. From the pond, the logs are transported to the mill by an endless spike conveyor, known as the jack chain. Thus do the giants of the forest meet their fate with the constructive goal of forestry is the sustained use and management of our forest to best serve mankind. As we gaze upon this palatial residence, it is difficult for us to believe that it is the main ranch house of the famous King Ranch in southern Texas where one may see some of the world's finest examples of livestock, including the colorful Santa Gertrudis cattle, a special breed developed by the King Ranch. Santa Gertrudis cattle are the result of crossbreeding between the shorthorn species of Texas and the Brahma breed of India, and they represent the first distinctive breed of United States cattle. And here is Ferdinand, the prize bull of the King Ranch. Cattle raising is the oldest industry in the state, and today it includes an export trade of two million head, representing an annual income of $60 million. In all, there are about seven million and a quarter head of cattle in Texas, the largest number in any state. The King Ranch is particularly proud of its highly bred horses, many of which have won high honors at the best racetracks in the Western Hemisphere. Aside from the prize winners, it is estimated that Texas has about 720,000 horses, the second largest number of any state in the Union. Incidentally, the King Ranch, representing over a million and a quarter acres, is now in the possession of the Clayburg family, direct descendants of Captain Richard King, who acquired the first few hundred thousand acres about a century ago. When not representing his state at Washington, Congressman Richard Clayburg spends much of his time at the ranch, where he won his reputation as being one of the best horsemen in North America. Much of the romance of Texas is associated with its colorful ranchmen, who have found in their homes on the range an ideal existence. And now, by way of diversion, Cowboy Acker of San Antonio, famous rodeo artist, will give us a little exhibition, assisted by his friend, Teamer Fur. And here is Junior Acker, who was literally born in the saddle. Ride him, cowboy! Oh, you've been around Texas mules all your life. And it's about time you learn how to handle them. 
This is not the way to lead a mule. Just watch me and I'll show you how simple it is. On the Shriner Y.O. Ranch near Kerrville, we behold one of the finest herds of Angora goats to be found anywhere in the world. In addition to having over three million of these Angora goats, which yield 83% of the nation's mohair, Texas has over 10 million sheep, yielding about 80 million pounds of wool annually. The forebears of the Texas Angora goats came from Asia Minor, where in 1849, the Sultan of Turkey presented seven choice specimens to the American ambassador for shipment to the United States. Shearing time comes twice a year, early in spring and again in autumn. Crews of shearers equipped with power clippers begin their journeyings, starting at the southern part of the goat country and working northward as the season advances until the entire flock has been clipped. The average goat yields about five pounds of mohair each year, and the bulk of this is shipped to New England textile manufacturers to be used chiefly for carpets and upholstery. And so each little goat gives up his coat of precious mohair twice each year and rushes back in the nude to begin the process all over again for next season. We are now in the citrus fruit belt of the lower Rio Grande Valley, consisting of over seven million citrus trees with 75% of them grapefruit. And this is one of the groves of John Sherry, the father of the Texas citrus industry. Repeated laboratory tests show that Texas grapefruit and oranges have the highest juice and sugar content of any grown in America. And the lower Rio Grande Valley is admitted by all authorities to have the finest natural citrus growing soil in the world. It is so rich that comparatively few growers use fertilizer. And that is one of the reasons why citrus growing can be done so much cheaper here than elsewhere. Flourishing citrus groves can be bought in the valley as cheap as $150 per acre. The tremendous size of the Lone Star State is best illustrated by the fact that at the same time citrus is harvested in the southern parts, there is snow lying in the northern regions. The fruit is gathered mostly by Mexican laborers, and the labor payroll amounts to well over a million dollars annually. Texas produces most of the nation's pink and deliciously tasting grapefruit. During the 1938 and 39 season, the Rio Grande Valley produced approximately 35,000 carloads of grapefruit, oranges, lemons, and tangerines. General W. W. Sterling, former chief of the Texas Rangers, is an ardent believer in the health-giving properties of fruit juices. And at Uvalde, we find another fruitarian who attributes much of his health and longevity to Texas fruit, John Garner, vice president of the United States and a true-born Texan. Whether it be at his home in Uvalde or at his office in Washington, his constant companion is Mrs. Garner, who has acted as his private secretary for the past 30 years or more, a home-loving couple who are a credit to Texas as well as to the nation. One of the reasons why the Garners love their native state is confirmed in scenes like this. Acres of wildflowers grow in profusion throughout Texas in the spring, and the most popular of them all is the famous blue bonnet, which has been adopted as the state flower. And here we have the pleasure of meeting Miss Evelyn Holt of the Texas Highway Department, the blue bonnet girl of this season, and one of the most popular young ladies in the Lone Star State. Outdoor life and recreational divertisements go hand in hand in Texas, where golf, Tennis, football, fishing, hunting, and all the other popular sports are featured in diversified and colorful settings. 
At the Dallas Country Club, in addition to golf, we observe feminine beauty and charm, typical of Texas. Ladies of Texas are particularly noted for their charm and hospitality, as well as their good taste in matters of dress and entertainment. And it is with sincerest reluctance that we bid farewell to these three and continue our journey along the Rio Grande Valley. We are now passing the little ghost town of Langtree, where law west of the Pecos was once administered with a gun by a self-appointed judge named Roy Bean. And here is the shack where he held his court. Once while holding an inquest, Judge Bean found a pistol and $40 on a murdered man, whereupon he fined the corpse $40 for carrying a concealed weapon and kept the money for his fee. We are now in one of the three ranges of the mountainous Trans-Pecos area of Texas, the Davis Mountains, which rightly belong to the great Rocky Mountain range of the United States. The country is principally devoted to cattle and sheep raising, but not far from here are silver and quicksilver mines. Atop of Mount Locke is the McDonald Observatory, second largest in the United States, built by the University of Texas and named after W.J. McDonald, who willed the university $800,000 for the purpose of erecting and equipping an astronomical observatory. A few hours journey from this region lies the key city of western Texas, El Paso, one of the most important gateways to the state and famed in history as the Paso del Norte, or Passage to the North, which was used by the Spanish explorers in their explorations of Texas. Splendid network of modern roads traveling throughout Texas by automobile is a safe and comfortable experience. It is fitting, therefore, that a word of praise should be given to the Texas Highway Department for the excellent manner in which it maintains over 22,000 miles of highway, as well as hundreds of beautiful roadside parks throughout the largest state in the Union. On the southwestern border of Texas lies a tremendous section of uninhabited land known as the Big Bend Country, which has been set aside for a national park. This great project has been sanctioned officially by Congress and formally by the National Park Service as one of the last four areas in the United States adaptable to national park preservation. The Mexican government has also become interested in the plan and unofficially has pledged 400,000 acres in the Mexican area, thereby creating the possibility of a great international park consisting of over a million acres and being the first of its kind on the North American continent. And it is in this picturesque setting that we meet Pete Crawford and Hugh Ferris, gun-toting and sharp-shooting Texas Rangers. The Texas Rangers were organized over a century ago, primarily to fight off the Indian and bandit raids along the Texas border, and they are still patrolling the same territory. What is now the exclusive haunts of the intrepid Texas Rangers may soon become an all-year-round international park, stretching a hand of friendship across the border to Mexico and sharing generously with a neighbor country the benevolent gifts of nature that were meant for all mankind. Austin, the capital city of Texas, was named after Stephen F. Austin, who nobly devoted his life to the foundation of the state and thereby won undisputed recognition as the father of Texas. The state capitol dominates the city from its position in Capitol Square. It is built of red Texas granite at a cost of $3,500,000, and it was erected by Chicago capitalists in exchange for 3 million acres of Texas public land. It contains a library and Confederate museum 
besides many executive halls. In this picturesque building, the governors of Texas have inaugurated their respective administrations, and not the least of these is ex-governor James V. Allred. It is now our pleasure to meet Judge Allred's successor, Governor Leo Daniel, the present governor of Texas, with his wife and daughter. The story of Governor O'Daniel's rise to political fame reads like a chapter in fiction. And needless to say, his devoted wife, as well as his popular daughter Molly, have always been his chief supporters. Lieutenant Governor Coke Stevenson is one of the most capable servants of the state, aside from being an excellent example of a square-jawed, straight-shooting Texan. It is a far cry from the governor's mansion in Austin to the national capital in Washington, D.C., but the story of Texas would not be complete if we did not meet the Texans who now represent their state and their country at the national capital. And here we have assembled one of the most important and powerful political groups in Washington today. Senator Morris Shepard, senior senator from Texas and chairman of the Military Affairs Committee. <music> senator Tom Connolly, chairman of the Senate Committee on Public Buildings and Grounds, one of the most colorful figures at the national capitol. <music> and Congressman Sam Rayburn, majority leader in the House of Representatives. the Supreme Court building, we meet a valiant guardian of the Constitution of the United States, Hatton Sumners, Congressional Chairman of the Judiciary Committee. At the Lincoln Memorial, we presume to draw a parallel between two great Americans, one who has passed on, leaving undying traditions, and one who is an ardent admirer of those traditions, John Garner, Vice President of the United States and one of the most important figures in national politics today. Born in Texas in modest circumstances, at an early age, Mr. Garner devoted his career to public service and his record today stands unchallenged. As a conservative Democrat, he believes there is enough common sense left in our country to restore safe and sane prosperity. And his remedy for this is nothing more than a sincere application of good old-fashioned Americanism. With Mr. Garner, we humbly stand before the monument of Abraham Lincoln, and we repeat the words that seem to emanate from this hallowed shrine, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Outstanding among Texans who have done great national service during recent critical years is Jesse H. Jones of Houston, federal loan administrator and former chairman of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Texas takes tremendous pride in the fact that Mr. Jones has had such a large part in saving thousands of banks and industries from destruction, 
has wisely and courageously used his tremendous powers for the public benefit and has earned high distinction over the entire nation and in foreign countries. He has achieved the reputation of being not only the country's largest banker, but most constructive and helpful banker. Mr. Jones served President Woodrow Wilson as director for military relief of the American Red Cross during the World War. Before concluding our cavalcade of Texas, it is fitting that we should meet Homer Price Rainey, president of the University of Texas, who was interviewed by Carl Hobbitzell, vice chairman of the Texas World Fair Commission, and an enthusiastic supporter of industry and education in the state of Texas. Mr. Hobbitzell questions Dr. Rainey regarding the attitude of the University of Texas towards the radicalisms that are now threatening the foundations upon which our country has been built. And Dr. Rainey answers that as far as the University of Texas is concerned, all the students are 100% American, and he invites us to visit that institution and draw our own conclusions. So here we are back in the city of Austin, gazing upon the imposing administration building of the University of Texas, where 12,000 students pledge allegiance to their country and support a system of education unexcelled by any other university in America. At the present time, there are 40 buildings associated with the university, representing an investment of over $25 million. From the stars and stripes flying over a great institution, one of many in the land of the free and the home of the brave, we are inspired with new hope in our American youth, and somehow the theme song of this university, entitled The Eyes of Texas Are Upon You, thrills us with national pride as it is rendered for our special benefit by the student band. of Texas are upon all Texans, and the eyes of the world are upon Texas, where man has accepted the benevolence and the challenge of Mother Nature in developing one of the richest areas of land in the world. And it is with this thought that we most reluctantly say, farewell to Texas, the lone star state and the largest son of Uncle Sam.